Over the next couple of months, Jeremy's campaign will set out how Labour will defeat the Tories, which is very, very important that this campaign focuses on that. Jeremy stands for fairness, equality, and more importantly, Jeremy's campaign will be about bringing people together. And I'm very proud to be part of that. So without any further ado, I'm going to invite the leader of the Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn, to come to speak to you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for coming along this morning at relatively short notice here at the Institute of Education. I want to share a few thoughts with you this morning about uh, this leadership campaign and about what we've achieved over the last 10 months. Labour is stronger. We've won every parliamentary by-election we've faced, three of them with very significantly increased majorities. We overtook the Tories in the May elections. We won all four of the mayoral contests in Liverpool and Salford, in London for the first time since 2004, and in Bristol for the first time ever. We also won Bristol City Council for the first time since 2003. Labour Party membership has gone from below 200,000 a year ago to more than half a million today. And as Kate explained, 183,000 supporters have registered in order to be part of this leadership debate. We've welcomed back the Fire Brigades Union into our Labour family. This is a big party. Big party because people have joined, a big party because an awful lot of people are very interested in how Labour is going to present itself for the future and what hopes they can offer to people who've been passed by in our society. And we've delivered some very concrete results for millions of people by our opposition in Parliament to this government's callous welfare policies. Three million families are over £1,000 better off this year because Labour stood up and opposed cuts to tax credits. That was Labour making a real difference for those at the sharp end, mobilising our supporters and those losing out, lobbying Parliament and challenging the Prime Minister week after week in the Commons and winning uh, votes in the Lords and defeating the government overall in Parliament. We won back billions of pounds for working class families directly improving the lives of working people and their families, which of course is exactly what the Labour Party was created to do. Just over a year ago, there were those in our party in Parliament who were unsure about whether to oppose the Welfare Reform Bill. <laughs> that was going to take £12 billion from the DWP budget, cash support for the less well-off, low-paid workers and the disabled. Today, we are very clear. We are proud to defend the tax credits built up by Gordon Brown and proud to defend our greatest creation, social security for all. And we did it again with personal independence payments for those with disabilities in the budget. We shamed the government into abandoning their plans to take four billion pounds from disabled people that helps them to live independent lives, live in dignity and decency within our society. That wasn't always the case. It was Labour that brought in the Disability Discrimination Act and so much more. At a time when the government has been giving yet more tax cuts to big business and the very wealthiest. We've helped change the debate on welfare. No front bench politician is now using disgraceful divisive terms like scrounger, shirker or skyver. They've been shamed by the reality of life for millions of our people in left behind Britain. That's laying the ground for a kinder, gentler politics that respects those unable to work, that treats disabled people with dignity. And there's no better advocate for disabled people 
and those in need than our current Shadow Work and Pension Secretary, Debbie Abrahams. And I thank her for the fantastic work she's done, is doing and will continue to do. I also want to pay tribute to our Shadow Chancellor, John MacDonald. Someone said of him the other day, he does the honest, straight-talking politics, but the kinder, gentler stuff is still work in progress. <laughs> but what John has done, more effective than any other politician, is demolish the case for austerity. He said, austerity is a political choice, not an economic necessity. Every single plank of George Osborne's failed and destructive economic program is being torn up. From a year ago, when Labour was too cautious in criticising cuts, now I'm really hard pressed to find even a Tory to defend it, as one fiscal target after another has been ditched, first by Osborne, now by Theresa May. The long-term economic plan is dead. Yes. Most people now believe the government's cuts are both unfair and bad for our economy. In post-Brexit Britain, even Tories like Stephen Crabbe and Sajid Javid are converts, making the case for tens of billions in investment. But it's Labour's Shadow Chancellor, John MacDonald, who led the way, and who earlier this week made the case for a national investment bank and a network of regional investment banks to redistribute wealth and power. As John said in Sunderland on Monday, we should now work to build a transformed economy where no one is left behind. I came into politics to stand up against injustice. The injustices that scar our society are not those of 1945. The watchwords then were want, squalor, idleness, disease and ignorance. And they've changed since I first entered Parliament in 1983. Today, what is holding people back, above all, are inequality, neglect, insecurity, prejudice and discrimination. In our campaign, I want to confront all five of these ills head on, setting out not only how Labour will campaign against these injustices in opposition, but also spelling out some of the measures the next Labour government will take to overcome them and move decisively towards a society in which opportunity and prosperity are truly shared, in which no individual is held back and no community left behind. Today, I want to set out one way in which the next Labour government will tackle one of these ills, that of discrimination. My first job in the trade unions was with the uh, National Union of Tailors and Garment Workers, now part of the GMB trying to reclaim unpaid wages, mostly for low-paid women workers in the clothing industry. Companies that conveniently went bust, owing their workers lots of money, and then reopened <coughs> under a marginally different name a few days later, um, with apparently no debts and no obligation to anybody. Disgusting and disgraceful <coughs> behaviour by unscrupulous employers. A few years before I started that role, the Labour government of Harold Wilson had, in its final days, passed the Equal Pay Act in 1970, inspired by the late great Barbara Castle, following an inspirational strike by women sewing machinists at Fords in Dagenham, a struggle immortalised in the excellent film Made in Dagenham. Those women workers stood up for equal pay, and after three weeks on strike, they won a pay rise. Their strike not only educated the workforce at Dagenham, it helped to educate the trade union movement and educate the wider society. And it was a real pleasure to invite some of the women to come and address my shadow cabinet on International Women's Day in March this year to help the education process. What's less well known is that another strike took place 16 years later in 1984, and for six weeks this time, for equal pay to actually be achieved. We all know that change can take time, but sometimes the delays cannot and will not be tolerated. Today, we are more than 45 years on from the Equal Pay Act, 40 years on from when I was chasing down lost pay, and still women are paid 20% less than men. As far back as 1951, 
the Equal Remuneration Convention of the International Labour Organization, a UN body, supported the principle of equal pay for men and women workers for work of equal value. 65 years on and women are overrepresented in the lowest paying sectors, cleaning, catering and caring, vital sectors to our economy, doing valuable work, but not work that is fairly rewarded or equally respected. And we know too that many disabled workers are not being given the same opportunities to fulfil their potential. Last year, Britain was ranked 18th in the world for its gender pay gap, below Nicaragua, Namibia and New Zealand. We can and must do far better. So Labour is calling time on the waiting game. And I'm making the commitment today that the next Labour government will require all employers to publish equality pay audits, detailing pay, grade and hours of every job alongside data on recognised equality characteristics. Because it's not women alone who face workplace discrimination, but disabled workers, the youngest and oldest workers, black and ethnic minority workers. Young workers are institutionally discriminated against, not entitled to the full minimum wage, not entitled to equal rates of housing benefit, and so many are now saddled with huge student debts, often of £50,000 and more. I want to pay tribute to our trade unions. They've won millions of pounds in equal pay claims for workers who face discrimination. They won them back pay and they also won them dignity and equality. But not every workplace is unionised and there are often complex cases that can take years. We're calling time on discrimination. And as we know from the minimum wage, proper enforcement matters and makes the difference. So we're also committing to fund the Equalities and Human Rights Commission. Fund it properly to deal with all aspects of inequality, injustice and discrimination in our society. To monitor employers' equality pay audits, to take action where required to eradicate discrimination and to fine employers that do not provide them. Many employers wouldn't want to discriminate against their staff. Such discrimination holds back companies and indeed our whole economy. If our economy is to thrive, it needs to harness the talents of everyone. So that is about making our economy stronger, the workplace fairer and reducing the discrimination that holds people back. Our labour movement is about improving people's lives, about ending injustices, about giving power to the powerless and building a society in which opportunity and wealth is shared. Over the next couple of months, we'll be setting out new policies each week on different aspects of our society, on human rights, on environment, on transport, on housing, many, many other issues. Because our campaign will set out how we plan to defeat the Tories and elect a Labour government that will act to tame the forces holding people back of inequality, neglect, insecurity, prejudice and discrimination. And to build a society in which no one and no community is left behind because the problems facing this country at the moment are inequality, are injustice, are whole communities where industries have closed, they haven't been replaced, infrastructure investment hasn't taken place and there is deep division. It cannot be right that some parts of Britain, you earn more than other parts of Britain. It cannot be right that this degree of inequality goes on. That is the mission we're going to be putting forward in, uh, in this uh, leadership campaign. And that is the campaign that we're going to put forward to set out how we, the Labour Party, will be stronger, even stronger, and hopefully even bigger at the end of this campaign and that we will defeat the Tories at the next general election. Build that society, that's our, that's our pledge, that's our promise, and that's what's so exciting about this leadership campaign. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you. I want to take some questions um, from Sky News. Jason Farrell. 
Okay. What is the time so hard in Sky? You have to share microphones. <laughs> have a whip round for Sky. <laughs> um, so, uh, just two questions, if I can. Uh, first of all, the big party you were talking about at the beginning, obviously you've got this new membership. Um, last time round, I think it's the same this time round, there will be a vetting process for people who join. And I wondered, as someone who sort of addressed May Day protests with lots of other parties at that address, whether you feel that people from other parties, such as social workers, should be allowed to join the Labour Party? Uh, and how, what do you feel about the vetting process? And secondly, uh, in the interest of transparency and equality, will you be publishing the pay breakdown of your own office? The membership issue is that anyone that signs up to join the Labour Party or support the Labour Party must support the aims and values and principles of the Labour Party. It's absolutely clear and they uh, should not be members of or campaigning for any other party. It's absolutely clear. That's what the, the process is for. I hope the process will be fairly carried out and that um, we welcome people to the Labour fold who've come in from other organisations, who've come in from other parties. That is what growing politics is all about. And of course the equal pay audit should be carried out for all employers. Thank you. The next question is from ITV News. Carl Dinon. Yep. Dinon? Okay. Have you got your own microphone, Carl? You don't need one. <laughs> I, love the, I love the way the private sector organisations cooperate together. Do you include the BBC in your cooperation? <laughs> Uh, you've come up with an interesting policy idea today, but the, the problem is, and this leadership campaign was sparked not by policy differences uh, amongst you and your MPs, but because your MPs just don't really think that you're up to the job. If you win, does that matter that your MPs don't support you? Look, uh, when we won the leadership election last year, we set out a series of policy changes and uh, we've done our best to carry those out. Crucially is the economic policy objective which John McDonnell has been leading on and I think pretty well everyone will concede that because of the work of John and our team the whole economic debate in Britain has fundamentally changed. Mm -hmm. That is what happens. We've changed politics in Britain. I'm coming to your question. Don't worry, I'm not avoiding your question. I promise you that. But you've got to let me answer it. It's a deal, okay? Um, I tried to appoint a very broad shadow cabinet uh, last September and uh, I think everyone would concede that I did appoint a broad shadow cabinet. I made some changes three months later and then straight after the um, European Union referendum a number of colleagues unfortunately decided to resign from the shadow cabinet and um, I had to appoint a lot of new members to the shadow cabinet. I want to thank those members that were appointed, some of whom had only been in Parliament for a year. And as an inveterate political watcher, I'm sure you will accept that they have stepped up to the plate and done a fantastic job. I say to Labour MPs quite simply this. I've been in Parliament a very long time. I've seen lots of leaders. I've seen them come and I've seen them go. There is a huge amount of talent on the Labour benches. We are part of, but not the entirety, of the Labour Party and the Labour movement. And I hope those that may not agree with me politically, may not even like me personally, I find that hard to believe, but there are some people apparently who don't, who don't like me, uh, I hold out the hand of friendship to them all because come September, when this election is done and dusted, there will still be a Tory government in office. There will still be grotesque levels of inequality in our society. There will still be whole parts of this country that are left behind Britain. It's the job, it's the duty, it's the responsibility of every Labour MP to get behind the party at that point and put it there against the Tories about the different, fairer kind of Britain that we can build together. And I appeal to them to work together to put that case forward because we owe it to the people that founded this party, that support this party, the half million who give their money and their time to help this party survive and strengthen and grow of the kind of better society we can put forward. I hope they will recognise that and come on board. I have um, an ability to very conveniently forget some of the unpleasant things that are said because it's not worth it. It's simply not worth it. from the BBC. BBC? Okay. Hi, Vicky. Um, just a question. Um, you've been in the Labour Party for a long time. Um, what do you think of the 
follow up on that. The reason you're here is because most of your own peas decided it's not that they don't like you, they don't think that you will ever be Prime Minister. Aren't you at all concerned so many of your own peas from across the breadth of the party? Well, I wish they hadn't. I wish they were uh, all on board and I wish they'd all played their full part in the economic debate yesterday when John McDonnell was really putting it to the government. I wish quite a lot of things. Um, I asked them to just think very, very carefully about this. We have a government that is creating worse divisions and poverty within our society. It's their job to get behind the party and campaign against this government. Um, do they think ill of me personally? I'm sure they don't. Do they think politically different to me? In some cases, possibly yes. But I think they will recognize that this leadership election is about having that political debate, but it's also about showing loyalty to the party and the movement. And so I hope yeah, they'll go on board. Huh? Why am I so frightening? If, you, if they fear it, why, is it, why am I so frightening? <laughs> yes. Ah, okay, okay. Well, listen, this party is going places. This party is strong. This party is capable of winning a general election. And if I'm leader of the party, I will be that prime minister. from Norman Smith, BBC. Norman, Norman Smith. Norman Smith. Are you Norman? No, he's not Norman Smith. Oh, sorry. Hang on, this can't be an event without Norman Smith present. <laughs> can we it's hold it till Norman Smith arrives? Okay, can, we, can, we, can we wait till Norman Smith arrives? Okay, the next one's from the Mirror. <laughs> ben Glaze, Glaze, Glazier, sorry. I'm sorry, I didn't fully hear that, but it was something about Diane Abbott on the radio this morning, yeah? Um, well, do you know what? Uh, I don't listen to the Radio 4 Today programme every day. Um, I'm sure I should, but um, I don't always do so. I understand, because I've followed it up on social media, she was critical of um, Owen Smith's involvement in the private healthcare sector uh, before he came into Parliament. Um, I hope Owen will fully agree with me that our NHS should be free at the point of use, should be run by publicly employed workers working for the NHS, not for private contractors, and that medical research shouldn't be farmed out to big pharmaceutical companies like Pfizer and others, but should be funded through the Medical Research Council as a way of developing those drugs and not allow the private pharma companies to become over-dominant in the way the NHS provides things, and that generic medicines are much cheaper than patented medicines and should be encouraged. Think of what happened in South Africa over antiretrovirals and the way they fought a very brave campaign for a long time in order to get affordable antiretrovirals which have saved lots of lives. So I just hope that, and I'm sure he will, Owen will come fully on board on the idea of our NHS being totally public and publicly employed people running it. The next one from The Telegraph, Ben Riley-Smith. Oh. Hi. I'm sorry, I, could, I couldn't probably hear it. Yeah. Well, Owen Smith was in the Shadow Cabinet until two weeks ago. <laughs> Um, and he came to see me to say he was very happy in the shadow cabinet and wanted to stay there and then left the meeting and resigned, which was a slightly odd thing to do. Um, but he, of course, of course, he's very welcome to come back and I hope, and I hope he would, um, because that's got to be the right way of doing things. Selection. Oh, mandatory reselection. At the moment, um, selection takes place when there is a trigger ballot um, 
system uh, where a constituency party decides whether or not it wishes to have a full selection process and that trigger ballot system pertains. There's going to be, as you know, a total boundary review which will be, the first report will be out this autumn and it will finally be implemented in 2018. If this parliament runs to full term then the new boundaries will be the basis on which selections take place. On that case there would be a full selection process in every constituency but the sitting MP for any part or any substantial part of the new boundary would have um, an opportunity to put their name forward. So there will be a full and open selection process for every Labour constituency, well every constituency Labour Party throughout the whole of the UK and uh, we'll know the first draft of the boundary review this year. But there are issues surrounding the boundary review, one of which is the electorate has gone up very significantly since last December when the cutoff date was uh, December the 8th for the registration of voters to decide the broad size of the new constituencies. There's been a huge increase in the electorate since then, mainly through registration work done by many parties, including ours, but also for the EU referendum. I think this is a time when the Electoral Commission and the Boundary Commission should look again at the figures being used for the new boundaries. Otherwise, we're going to usher in new boundaries that are already unfair and unequal from the very beginning. The boundary review must reflect the makeup of our population. Young people, mobile populations, black and minority ethnic populations are disproportionately underrepresented on the electoral register. I want to change that and I urge the Boundary Commission to reflect very carefully on what they do before they come up with their new proposals. And the last question from Peter Walker from The Guardian. Hi. Hi. Um, during all the talk about what the new Labour government will do, you, you know, you kind of talked about the victories in the, uh, the by election, the mayoral uh, election, you've not had yet mentioned the opinion polls, which show the idea of the Labour government doesn't actually seem realistic at the moment. Do you think the polls are wrong or do you think they'll change? I think that the polls will change and will improve for us. We did gain a considerable amount of support between May 15 and May 16 and in the local elections in England the results were not uniform across the whole country. We did very well in the number of southern councils where your paper and many others were predicting we would lose many seats and indeed others were predicting 300 losses. There were 18 losses. It's a big difference between 18 and 300. And um, we have gained support. I think that um, once this leadership election is over, many will realise the importance of the message we're putting forward, of the kind of decent, equal society we can create, and the way in which we can say to families, whatever their economic situation, are you comfortable with so many people being homeless? Are you comfortable with levels of inequality in society? Are you comfortable with the waste that poverty is on the lives of so many people? Support will grow for us. This Conservative government has nothing to offer other than tax cuts at the top end, corporate tax cuts and a continuing cycle of despair and decline in the ways it funds local authorities, particularly in the poorest parts of Britain. You could overlay a map of poverty in Britain with the depth of the cuts being made by this government and you would see the same map. A Labour government would do it the other way round. <laughs>